Hello, I'm Dottie Kay of the League of Women Voters of Upper St. Clair. Welcome to the first of our community informational meetings to be presented on public access television. Sponsored by the League and by Mr. Robert Hackett, attorney at law on the law and your local government. The series will begin with the home rule system of government which we have in Upper St. Clair, how it came about and what it means to us as residents of this community. Future programs will explain separation of power, township fiscal matters, and zoning. Our format for this presentation consists of a lecture and a general summary of each topic, followed by a discussion of the particular subject of League members and Mr. Hackett. Although the programs are taped, the discussions are unrehearsed and spontaneous. Now, let me introduce you to Mr. Hackett. He is an attorney at law, the Upper St. Clair Township attorney since 1975, and a resident of this township since 1960. He has offices in Upper St. Clair and is affiliated with the law firm of Strasburg & McKenna in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mr. Hackett? Hello. It's a real pleasure for me to talk to the community in which I've lived for so long about the law and the local government. And in particular, it's such a pleasure to tell you the genesis of the local government system in Upper St. Clair. Upper St. Clair is very lucky and very fortunate to have what is known in Pennsylvania as a home rule system of government. This system of government, however, did not come e easily to the communities in Pennsylvania. In order to really look at the genesis of this system, we must go back to the beginning of the organization of government in America. In short, we should go back to the 10th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. I'll read that to you. It's not very long. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. In the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, our forefathers organized the federal government to allow as much freedom as possible to the states. Pennsylvania enacted its constitution under which we are now governed in 1874. At that time, the Pennsylvania Constitution was a traditional constitution as it applied to local municipalities. That is, when you look at the Pennsylvania Constitution and at the way the Pennsylvania Constitution applied to local communities, it was a system of parental guidance. Local communities 
under the traditional Pennsylvania system of government were only allowed to do what the state told them to do. The Constitution at that time provided no ability for a local municipality to function by itself with its own powers. In order to implement this parental system of local government, the state enacted various codes for the different communities. The borough code, the second class township code, the first class township code. In the early history of Upper St. Clair, Upper St. Clair was a second class township. And that, I think, literally meant what the state uh, called a second class place. That is, in a second class township in the early days of Upper St. Clair, all the supervisors could do was do what the word supervisor meant to the state, supervise the roads. That was the total capacity, in essence, of a supervisor in a second class township. Later, Upper St. Clair became a first class township. At that time, Upper St. Clair would follow the first class township code. However, the commissioners elected in a first class township, rather than supervisors in a second class township, were again only able to do what good old father state told them to do. I really consider this a contrast and a contradiction to the Tenth Amendment to the Federal Constitution. Because the Tenth Amendment said, if the US Constitution says that the federal government does it, they do it. But if it says nothing, then the states or the people can do it. Rather, the state constitution said, if we don't tell you people you can do it, you can't do it. Well, this form of government stayed in Pennsylvania until the constitutional changes in 1966, 67, and 68. I believe that those constitutional changes came about because the people in the suburbs were becoming so numerous. That is, the movement away from Philadelphia, which is a first class city, and Pittsburgh, which is a second class city, into the suburbs caused rumblings. The people that lived in Upper St. Clair or Mount Levin or Montgomery County uh, near Philadelphia wanted to have more say in their government. They didn't want to go to Harrisburg to know if they could hire four policemen or five policemen. They wanted to do it their way. Therefore, in the 1968 constitutional amendments to the Pennsylvania Constitution, there was enacted home rule provisions. These home rule provisions allowed in 1968, the legislature to adopt a Home Rule Government Act. And the legislature in 1974, after six years of grumbling and bumbling, enacted the 1974 Home Rule Act, which was called Act 62 by almost everyone. This act enabled communities, Act 62, enabled communities to get out from the parental control of the state and build their own home rule government. Upper St. Clair in 1975 called a home rule charter group together and was one of the first, if not the first, community in Allegheny County to enact the home rule form of government. This was done by having many long meetings and deciding on what kind of a charter we would have. Because for any home rule community to function, one needs a charter or, in fact, a local constitution. It's very, very comparable to look at the United States Constitution, the Pennsylvania Constitution, and then look on the charter in Upper St. Clair as the Upper St. Clair Constitution. The citizens voted on the Home Rule Charter in Upper St. Clair, 
And in January of 1976, Upper St. Clair became a home rule community. Now, what did this mean to Upper St. Clair? It meant that Upper St. Clair, for, to a great extent, had the freedom to act on its own. That is, instead of having the philosophy that a municipality could only do what the state told it could, said it could do, Act 62 said that a municipality can do anything the state says it can't do. A completely different philosophy. This charter and philosophy was limited, however, in Act 62 by what has referred to as Section 302. The state enacted a limitation on just what the local communities could do. As you know, the father can't let the children do everything. And this is what Section 302 does. 302 says that there are 10 limitations on what a local government can do. Those limitations are, one, that a local government cannot enact legislation that affects the collection of municipal tax liens and the sale of real estate. Two, you can't mess around with eminent domain, condemnation. The state has a condemnation code. You must obey the state's code. Number three, you can't change the boundaries of your municipality. That is, one municipality cannot uh, leapfrog into the next municipality and pick up some land. Number four, you can't regulate public schools. Number five, you can't pass legislation in a local municipality that affects electors and the conduct of elections. Number six, you can't fix the subject of taxation. Not the rate now, just the subject. Number seven, you can't fix the rate of taxes on non-residents so that your taxation would affect non-residents. Number eight, you can't affect how real property is assessed. That's done under state law. You can, of course, pass tax on real property, but you can't pass laws affecting the method of assessment. Number nine, you cannot interfere in the punishment for a felony or a misdemeanor. That is, you must stay away from the state crimes code. And number 10, and most important to Upper St. Clair, you must abide by the Pennsylvania Municipalities Planning Code. Therefore, in Upper St. Clair, the local government, with its charter, can do anything except what is prohibited in Section 302 of the Home Rule Charter Act. Thus, in 1976, Upper St. Clair had a rebirth of local government. It could pass many, many laws which affected its citizens emanating out of the Upper St. Clair Charter. The Charter starts us off with quoting exactly what Upper St. Clair can do. And it follows the general philosophy of home rule. It says that Upper St. Clair commissioners may do anything not prevented by state law or federal law. A very broad, sweeping, radical change for the citizens of Upper St. Clair in 1976. And Upper St. Clair Township, as I said, was one of the very first first-class townships to adopt such a sweeping change. Now let's, for a few more minutes, look at the essence of the charter. What was the philosophy in adopting the Upper St. Clair Charter? What were the fathers of the charter trying to do in Upper St. Clair? When reading the charter, you will find that the charter is what is known as a strong manager's charter. That is, that the forefathers who adopted the charter wanted to keep the manager of the township in a non-political atmosphere 
and wanted the manager of the township to function with day-to-day -day business as a business person, free from the interference or administrative control of the governing body or the commissioners. And that is what the charter says. That is a unique type of government. There are not many communities in Pennsylvania that have that. Naturally, the commissioners have the right to remove the manager. The commissioners are the elected officials. But the commissioners do not have the right under the charter to interfere in the day-to-day -day operations of government. The forefathers felt that the way the people should speak was through their elected commissioners. Thus, the people elect the commissioners, five from different wards and two at large, and the commissioners appoint the manager. But the charter said that the manager has total administrative control over the functions of the township, even to the point where the commissioners should not talk to employees of the township, but should talk to those employees only through the manager. This system of strong management has given Upper St. Clair a very cohesive and efficient strong manager system over the last eight or nine years. Thank you, Bob. I would now like to introduce the league panel members to my left, Trudy Rose and Pat Hyde. Bob, I just, am I under the understanding that you're saying that the only job the commissioners have are to hire or dismiss the township manager? No, I don't think that your summary is the only job that the commissioners have. The commissioners are the legislative body of the township. They are comparable to the Congress of United States. Now, the Congress of United States cannot order the Secretary of Defense to do something. The Congress of the United States passes laws, and the commissioners pass laws. What I'm trying to emphasize is that under the Charter, and specifically, I believe it's sections 308 and 309 of the Charter, the commissioners are limited in what they can do administratively with the township's government. That is, the commissioners act by passing laws. The commissioners act by hiring or firing the manager. If, for example, you think a policeman or person is driving his car too fast, a commissioner has no right to go to the police person and say, you were driving your car too fast. Won't you stop? The commissioner must go through the body of the commissioners acting as a whole, and that's what the charter says, acting as a whole, and go to the manager and say to the manager, get your police persons under control. It's your job to see they don't drive the cars too fast. I think that is an example of what I mean by the limited availability of commissioners to manage or task manage the township. Uh, we now have home rule. Thank you. Thank you. We now have home rule. But I would like to go back before that. We first were a second class township and then we became a first-class township. That's correct. Uh, how is this done? Well, the first-class, second-class township and the uh, further divisions of uh, different governments in Pennsylvania uh, were done by statute of the state legislators, and uh, it generally depended on population. And you had to have a certain population to become a borough a certain population to become a third-class city, and in the same manner, you had to have a certain population to be a first-class township over a second-class township. So once you achieved that population and you had the characteristics of the particular law, you could then uh, file for your charter and start as a first- or second-class township depending on your population. Thank you. Pat? I'd like to um, 
get into the development of the charter. Uh, we know that the voters passed a charter, but I think that it's important to discuss how the Charter Commission came about. I know there were many meetings, but how did the Charter Commission come about? Well, the Charter Commission uh, is authorized and comes about by uh, using Act 62, which is the Home Rule Charter Act. And uh, under, after the 1968 Constitution amendments, uh, the legislator passed Act 62, and Act 62 said that you had to follow certain procedures if you wanted to attempt to be a home rule community. Those procedure, procedures included the old government, that is the first class township government, appointing what w amounted to a home rule charter commission. And that appointment was made uh, in 74 or 75, I forget the exact year, and then the Home Rule Charter Commission prepared a Home Rule Charter report and a recommendation to adapt a certain Home Rule Charter, and then that recommendation was placed on the ballot, and the citizens of Upper St. Clair voted on that recommendation, which brought about the Home Rule Charter form of government. Well, I guess the uh you said appointed, but as I recall, and I'm one of a few people who have happened to be around back in those days, but that, in fact, the Charter Commission was elected by the voters of, of Upper oh, St. Clair. I'm sorry. I, I, I misunderstood yeah. when you say how it came about. I'm, I'm misunderstanding. You, you want right. mechanically whether or not the uh, Home Rule Charter Commission, when I say appointed, you, you're, you're distinguishing that the citizens elected them and they That's ran right. for the commission. You're absolutely right. correct, Pat. That's well, correct. And the fact that, um, there, as I recall, there were seven members. Uh, six of them uh, men, uh, one woman, uh, a later another woman was appointed to, to fill a vacancy. Uh, also, as I remember, the um, there was a, a township commissioner, there was a a corporate officer, there was an attorney, um, there was a yes, know, Republicans believe. and Democrats. It was a it was a broad based committee, and I think that that point is very important to uh, the people in Upper St. Clair. Well, I think I think it is too, and I think it's very uh, typical of Upper St. Clair because traditionally, uh, Upper St. Clair, in my opinion, has not allowed. Uh, politics to interfere in their government. Most of their commissions have been nonpartisan commissions, and I think that Upper St. Clair uh, followed this tradition in the Home Rule Charter Commission and appointed a group of competent citizens, which, uh, whether they be Democrat or Republican or whatever, carried out the, the making of the charter, so to speak, in a very, very reasonable and good way. I would, I would agree with that, and uh, uh, I, I think that that's part of uh, the fact that we've had a charter for 10 years, and it's worked, and uh, it hasn't been changed, and I know Trudy and had I, uh, wanted to ask uh, something about that. Right. Some communities uh, have added and deleted from their original charters. And uh, some communities have a provision, say, uh, if the uh, millage is raised over a specific amount, that that may actually have to go to a vote of the public. The public may vote on that. Um, how would our charter, how could our charter be changed if such an amendment was desired? Well, it is possible to change our charter, and the charter can be changed uh, by vote of the citizens of the township. And you are quite correct. Uh, I believe that Mount Lebanon Township has a provision that their taxes can only be raised to a certain millage on real estate. And uh, any home rule charter community could adopt such a restriction on taxation if they wish to. Uh, the the forefathers of the charter uh, did not believe that was a proper uh, thing, item, uh, restriction to put in the charter. And 
I happen to agree with them as a matter of viewpoint because I think the remedy is uh, to elect new commissioners, and I think that's a better remedy than having the charter restricted. But you are right in that that could be adopted by the voters of Upper St. Clair. And the charter provisions to, to have amendments uh, contain uh, methodology for amendment that it be adopted, uh, I believe, first by the commissioners and then that it be formally presented to the election people for uh, amendment at a, an election and it would be on the ballot and if they wanted to adopt such an amendment, it could be done. The charter also provides, not for an amendment to the charter, but it also provides for the citizens to speak out in initiative and referendum and we probably will discuss that later in one of our sessions. Well, one of my, my follow-up question was how an individual or a group of individuals can, uh, how they can get something to become a referendum, an item to become a referendum. Well, Trudy, let me answer your question as I understand it on how to amend the charter by referring to section 1605, which is quite short. Amendments to this charter may be framed and proposed in accordance with the provisions of the laws of the Commonwealth governing home rule charters, which leads you back to Act 62, which was the original Home Rule Charter Act, 1974, which leads you back to the Constitution, which provides for initiative and referendum in amending a Home Rule Charter in accordance with certain procedures that citizens can use, including timing and the amount of citizens and so on, that get a charter amended so that our charter uses the state law to get changed. Now then, there is also other provisions in our charter which refer to initiative and referendum. I don't know whether you wish to discuss that or not. Well, now that it's brought up, perhaps the clarification that there's a referendum to change the charter, there's also a referendum on ordinances. And yes. so that now we know there are two ways that a citizen can try, can uh, approach our government, our home rule government, to have a referendum. And I was on the second item thinking primarily of referendum on an ordinance. Right. Well, then you're, you're getting at the Charter's basic method that the Charter gave citizens to influence what laws the commissioners pass in the Home Rule Charter community. Yes, we have those provisions. Those provisions, I believe, are in the 1400 sections in the Charter, and those provisions allow a citizen to use the citizen's power to be heard to either have an ordinance adopted or have an ordinance repealed. That is, the use of the words initiative and referendum mean that if the citizens get together and take certain actions under sections 1400 and 04, I believe, and, and uh, the following sections, they can have on the ballot a certain ordinance, and if that ordinance is then voted on and adopted, it becomes an ordinance of the township. There is, I believe, 15% required of the citizens in the township to sign a petition. And if they sign that a petition, either to repeal an ordinance or to adopt an ordinance, that places the, the ordinance or question, whatever it may be, on the ballot. Now this was the big argument that Mount Lebanon had on the Bird Park, remember. Mount Lebanon said we won't issue the petition, citizens, because we don't think you have standing. They lost that case in court after a very costly battle, and I think that was a real mistake because it's obviously the intent of our charter to let citizens be heard. And citizens do have the ability to be heard by using the petition mechanism to trigger either the adoption or rejection of an ordinance. Thank you. Okay, you're saying that uh, 15, a, a petition with 15% uh, of the registered voters, 
uh, from, I believe it's the last municipal <laughs> election, something like that, it, that is reasonable. I mean, if uh, it's, it, it would not be a frivolous petition uh, because 15% of the voters is a, a reasonable number, but I agree it, with it's that. not um, uh, out of the realm of, of possibility that no. I don't. No, I don't think it is out of the realm of possibility. There's some interesting uh, ramifications of that. For instance, can you use the initiative and referendum uh, situations to uh, get something uh, passed which uh, would perhaps, uh, in the opinion of the commissioners or the opinion of legal counsel, uh, infringe on state law. And if I give them such an opinion, should, should petitions be issued on that subject if I think it's a subject that petitions shouldn't be issued on? Well, uh, that's never been tested, thank goodness, but you get into some very interesting questions on what a petition should be issued for and what it shouldn't. And as I said, that was the litigation in Mount Lebanon was involved in that. Well, in a way, what I'm going to ask might, might seem frivolous, but we do have an ordinance, for instance, that requires dogs to be leashed. Yes. Uh, now, I happen to be a bird lover, and I see cats in my neighborhood attacking birds. So could I attempt to get petitions to say that I think that we ought to have a leash law for cats? Uh, it's one of two things, one either to have an ordinance passed um, to have cats leashed or, or to say possibly the, the, the dog leashing ordinance might be discriminatory or, or something like that. But are those... I like that be... idea, Pat. If you had discrimination against dogs and cats, <laughs> think of all the litigation that would arise for attorneys to make money on. Uh, yes, the answer to your question is yes. You could have a petition that would require a home rule community to not allow cats to wander and that would have cats leashed. Uh, that is a typical idea that is acceptable to the process of petition and referendum or initiative and referendum, and uh, there's no reason that that couldn't happen. But it would take some time. But it would take and some time. Take time. And, and I think the hurt. process should be a long process. Yes, it shouldn't be an easy process because you're, you're talking about having a vote on uh, and adopting a law. And in essence, uh, you elected commissioners. So it's something the commissioners either did or didn't do. And it should be a rather difficult process. I have a question, Bob. If a citizen wanted to put together a petition to take out among the citizens, and they were having difficulty writing it. Not everyone would know how to write a petition. Is there anywhere they can go for help without having to pay a legal fee? Well, I guess they could consider going to the neighborhood legal services, but I believe they're almost out of money under the uh, uh, budget cutting procedures that have happened in the federal government. So no, I don't think there's any place that would really offer that type of service that would, uh, say, draft or prepare a petition for citizens. And of course, I wouldn't be authorized to do it uh, because I work for the commissioners. And by the way, I do not work for the manager. I work for the commissioners, uh, which is an exception in the charter. And uh, therefore, I would not be authorized to do it unless the commissioners authorized me to do so. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Any of the panel? Well, I would like to say that this is the code of the township of Upper St. Clair. It has all your laws and regulations in it. It is in the library, and anyone can go down and look up anything they would like in it. Mr. Hackett, is there anywhere in the township or any place a citizen can go or a person to purchase one of these books? Yes, those books can be purchased from the township if uh, a citizen desires. Uh, they are quite expensive. I believe they're $100 or $150. Uh, those books, uh, however, are available. And 
And I might just add that uh, the books are organized uh, rather uh, simply so that they're easily understood. Uh, it contains the charter, then the administrative or internal code of the township that governs personnel policies and so on. And then the third part is the general legislation, which governs, governs things such as the zoning ordinance, subdivision ordinance, traffic ordinance. So those three separate uh, parts of the really make up the code. Thank you. This concludes the first in our series of the law and local government. Next time, our topic will be separation of power. If you have any program suggestions for the League Community Information Programming, please write League of Women Voters of Upper St. Clair, 171 Boxfield Road, Pittsburgh, 15. And I'm Dottie Kay, the president of the league, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank Bob Hackett, attorney at law, for being with us for the first series, and our panel members, Trudy Rose and Pat High.